Good evening. Um, we're about to start tonight's event. Uh, I've been tasked with saying uh, some opening remarks that are really short, I promise. Um, BC is proud to host this evening's lecture series entitled Prudent Rebels, Comedians and the First Age of Revolution, 1774 to 1849. This event is a collaborative effort between the Bermuda College, the Department of Community and Cultural Affairs, and the National Museum of Bermuda. I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the presence of, I have Minister Robin. I think he came for a short time and had to leave, but he was here. Um, <laughs> the Honorable Levita Fogo, JPMP, Minister of Labor, Community Affairs and Sport, Dame Jennifer Smith, who's sitting right here in the middle of the second row. And last but not least, everyone who came out this evening to support this event. On behalf of the president, staff, faculty, and students of Bermuda College, welcome to our humble abode. We wish you an interesting and fun filled evening. I think I've now due to hand over the mic to Minister Fogo. Good evening, everybody, and I want to thank uh, the person who preceded me for getting the protocol out there. And uh, and uh, what I'm going to do is um, skip part of what's written in front of me because I don't have to speak to it since he mentioned one of two words that I would have said. But I would like to point out that indeed this is a collaborative uh, effort. Um, on all of uh, the departments and organizations that he spoke to. And uh, the Department of Community and Culture thought that this would be a great opportunity to be able to help these, I'll call them young authors, <laughs> in putting um, another version of history out there so that overall the impact is so that we get a far more accurate depiction of what it was like back during that time and what role Bermuda had to play in all of that. And I do want to say this, the Historical Heartbeats Lecture Series coming out of the Department of Community and Culture features a monthly event highlighting our island's rich historical and cultural heritage for Bermuda's residents and visitors alike. So this opportunity that we have here tonight uh, fits well into what the Heartbeat series does. We are pleased to recognize Dr. Clarence V.H. Maxwell. You can put your hand up so they know who you are. <laughs> Dr. Theodore Francis II, <laughs> oh, well, you know, did you put your hand up? Because you know, the, um, the names these days are used for either sex, so just because it's Theodore doesn't mean it's you. <laughs> Alexandra Mares Kasler. And we want to uh, thank them for the launch of their book, as was said to you earlier, Prudent Rebels. Prudent Rebels can be considered an essential addition to the growing collection of works detailing Bermuda's history and its rule in the wider global community. This book chronicles how Bermuda, despite our ge geographical location, and isolation, reacted to and played a role in many of the critical global events in the, in the 18th and 19th century. We are very proud of this publication, as I said earlier, um, and we are excited for this partnership with both the uh, National Museum 
of Bermuda and for tonight with Bermuda College and um, being the venue to have this uh, great lecture take place. And so it allows us in a different way to be a part of a journey and it allows us to participate in ensuring that we get the history out there to the folks so that, and I think Preston's heard me say it the other evening, so that we have a better understanding of who we are because we learn even more from where we came. And so the Bermuda government is indeed proud to recognize and support your efforts. And, um, and, and on that note, I'm going to stop speaking because I think nothing further needs to be said. But thank you for uh, your book, Prudent Rambles. We are all will benefit from it. Yes. Thank you very much, Minister Fogo. Uh, before I introduce the authors, uh, I'd just like to give an indication in terms of how the evening will proceed. Uh, after the authors have given their lecture, we're going to have a short question and answer period. Uh, you will have been given uh, note cards, and um, if you'd like to write down a question for consideration, there are two people who are going to be collecting those. They have their hands up, uh, members of the team from the National Museum of Bermuda. So you can pass those note cards down to them, and uh, we'll take it from there. You don't have note cards? All right. Uh, if you can, anybody who would like a note card and doesn't have one, if you can uh, just raise your hands so that they can pass those on to you. We'd like all the questions. <laughs> all right. I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Clarence V.H. Maxwell. Dr. Maxwell is presently Assistant Professor of History at Millersville University in Lancaster, Pennsylvania in the United States, where he teaches on topics concerning the Latin American and Caribbean history, the African diaspora, and the Atlantic world. He is to be co-director of the Atlantic World Center, a center which focuses on managing the research, instruction, and presentation on 1,000 years of Atlantic world history. The university will officially inaugurate the AWC on the 1st of July of this year. He is also co-advisor for the university's new multidisciplinary Atlantic world studies major, which offers courses and instruction on Atlantic history and archaeology at Millersville University. Dr. Maxwell was formerly employed at the former Bermuda Maritime Museum, now the National Museum of Bermuda, as Registrar and Director of Historical Research. He serves as Associate Editor of the Bermuda Journal of Archaeology and Maritime History, an annual multidisciplinary peer-reviewed publication of the National Museum of Bermuda. Dr. Theodore S. Francis II is an Assistant Professor of History in the Department of Humanities and Fine Arts at Houston Tillotson University in Austin, Texas. Theodore graduated from Morehouse College before earning his MA and PhD in Caribbean Atlantic World History at the University of Chicago. He teaches courses on African American, Caribbean, and United States history. In addition to teaching, he advises the campus chapter of the National Association of Colored People, the International Students Association, and the YNA Fellowship, an organization focused on mental health awareness and suicide prevention among young people of color. His research interests focus on the history of segregation and black leisure travel in the Caribbean and the Americas during the 20th century. He is currently working on a manuscript exploring the role of African American tourism in the Caribbean civil rights struggle to desegregate Bermuda in the 1960s. Alexandra Mares Kessler is a doctoral candidate in history at the University of Delaware. She has a background in archaeology and museum studies with an emphasis on public history and public presentation. Alexandra also has an interest in combining history and archaeology in the classroom. Her current research focuses on loyalist merchants in the wake of the American Revolution, particularly in Bermuda, Nova Scotia, and East Florida. 
She lives in Pennsylvania with her husband and daughter and is a former student of Dr. Maxwell. Please join me in welcoming our three authors. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, I'm the, the anchor man of this race, um, so I'm going to try not to drop the baton, um, otherwise Theo will kill me. <laughs> I'm going to start with the story as I always do, and this story relates to this man. It's called Shoot the Governor Through the Head. Uh, this is William Popple. Popple was governor premier from 1747 to about 1764. Died in office. He died, didn't die in office. He died. Um, he quit and then. <laughs> long story. Uh, um, Popple was in 1747. Um, Popple arrived in Bermuda and one of the um, most controversial governors of that 18th century. When there were a number of them. Um, when he arrived, his time was rough. Uh, they, uh, the House of Assembly decided that they were not going to, they, the usual meeting was to meet with him, ask him if he was going to do a particular bill of, of, of uh, assembly, ask if he was going to do it, he would say he'd said no, and the result was they held his salary as well as didn't pay the salary of any of the judiciary either. So Popple, by the time 1750 came along, Popple was having one of the worst administrative experiences of his life. Gridlock, nobody was getting paid. No one in the assembly, no one in the executive, and no one in the judiciary. Popper was getting frustrated, so he decided he was going to send a note, a letter of complaint to Whitehall in Parliament, basically, in Whitehall in England, basically saying, I need to show you that there are three people in that assembly who are holding up the assembly, and they're not letting me do what I need to do. While he was writing the letter, there was a man, one of the things Pablo didn't realize is everybody's related to everybody in Bermuda. <laughs> so when you complain about somebody, somebody's gonna know about it. And of course, there was a guy who knew about it and it started grumbling. Well, if those three people that you're complaining about, he said, they will basically call all the assembly members, line up outside a government house and fire on the government house and with you in it. So Pablo said, Pablo said nothing. And then turned around again, the governor, um, then he turned around and said something that was crucial. The same man then said, there was one particular individual who said that was going to pay 10 pounds to any soldier that would shoot you through the head. Mm. Now, Popple, of course, is unflappable, not really. But he, he then and he went and basically complained about this particular thing. He went to White House and said, I'm going to find out who this person is. Well, he found out who the person was. It was a man by the name of Cornelius Hinson, the Speaker of the House of Assembly. <laughs> That, by the way, should give you an idea of what it was like to be governor of Bermuda, of one of the longest, second longest serving governors of Bermuda. And the issue of his, of his situation was quite simply reduced to this. Number one, Bermuda had created two maritime classes. One of them was what we call a hydrarchy. I know that's an awful word. I know that's an awful word, but it basically means, it, I'll explain it in a few minutes. And the second is even worse than that, <laughs> a thalassocracy. In, in all, in what always one should always do is try to find complicated Greek words in order to follow people, and that way no one gets complaints. That's issue number one. Issue number two is this, that these two, this hydrarchy, West End hydrarchy, had absolutely controlled the House of Assembly, and had great and developed a considerable amount of power that would fight, create, a, create conflict between the governor and the assembly. They dominated numerically the House of Assembly. I'll explain how they do that, did that. But the result, of course, was that this recreated in Bermuda a weak elite consensus. And that is one of the contexts we'll explain, which my good colleagues will then explain further. The thesis I want to argue is quite simple. Both issues are the, are the crux of what we would call the creation of a prudent rebel mentality among the local population. This is what would become the context of how they will participate, both the hierarchy and the celestocracy, how they would con 
They would contribute and shape this moment, the American Revolutionary War, which I put in quotation marks because there are several American revolutions. I'm really tired of the British American one taking over. There are, there are Latin American ones, there are Mexican ones, there is a Haitian one, all of those are American, but anyway, I digress. And, so, and also I begin it in 1776 because that is when the actual revolutionary element of that began, but that's for another day. Let me explain context quickly. Hydrarchies, here's the horrible word. It's basically nothing more than this, the construction of a maritime state, a creation by, de uh, by definition of a legal political system upon which utilizing the maritime connections to build a maritime state, using the parliament, using the executive to construct and to create laws that, that control maritime economic activity. West End political power therefore was based on, we call, we use, I, I call it hydro, but, uh, partly because it's water involved, but also because of supremacy, primacy, as well as dominion. They had constructed their own political system. Hydrarchies everywhere constructed their own political system based on their maritime economic power. There are a lot of hydrarchies in the Atlantic world. And there they are. My friend at the top is King Carlos III of, of Spain. The one to the right, the, well, the one, the long one, is uh, King William III of England. He's the one who actually constructed the, much of the maritime, British maritime state. And last but not least is no less than King Louis XIV all of them constructed a maritime state, a hydrarchy. But the one that's significant in this context is the one created by this dude. Um, in 1650, Oliver Cromwell became, became um, Lord Protector, well, he was Lord Protector, they killed the king and of course became um, um, Lord Protector of England. Um, Britain is one of the few countries that actually kills their kings. Um, <laughs> um, mercantilism is the Interesting days of Brexit, huh? Um, <laughs> mercantilism is part of this particular question, and that is what is what you probably remember in school is mercantilism is nothing more than the construction of this hydrarchy, this maritime state that served to make to serve the power of England. I mention this because I said there were several of these hydrarchies, all of them competing, but there was also also American hydrarchies. One's in Philadelphia, one's in Boston, and of course I'll talk about the one in Bermuda. And all of them are constructed competitive maritime states competing with each other to control the Atlantic world. Sometimes this meant trading with people you're not supposed to trade with. And Philadelphians were very good at trading with people they were not supposed to trade with. What you call smuggling is part of the, I would, when we've always argued one of the biggest problems with that word is that it gives itself, it's, it's what the state likes to call what other people do. But is it nothing more than trading with people who, is be who benefit you? And that's exactly what the Hydrarchies did. They traded with people who benefited them. What was oftentimes called smuggling. <laughs> that meant trading with places like San Domingue. You buy their sugar even though you're not supposed to and you smuggle it into Rio and you don't pay duty on it. <coughs> that's exactly what they, that they did. Which brings me now locally. Having explained all these other Hydrarchies, let's explain the one in Bermuda, how are we doing? Okay. Uh, we all know how we became a maritime state, so I won't bore you with that. But I will tell you this. Maritime commercial revolution, of course, is what created these two, these two entities. But particularly, the West End constructed, let's name them, Sands, Southampton, Warwick, maybe Paget, uh, definitely Pembroke. All of them constructed for themselves a maritime power in the West End. And by, as you can see, there are five of these guys, multiply that by two, and you will get a total West End domination of the, of the House of Assembly. Which meant that that House of Assembly is not going to do anybody else's interest, but do theirs. <laughs> and that's precisely what happened. So we found out what they were doing. This is my colleagues. My, my, um, part of it was called smuggling. And part of it was smuggling, this is, I don't know whose house it is, but. Anyway, uh, where we, where we, my Millersville, we dug in their backyard. And what we did was we found evidence of their continued smuggling with the French. They even bragged about it. In these islands, adjacent to Eli's Harbor and, and the Harbor of Pearl Lane, three-fifths of all commodities, particularly provisions, are vended and sold. In other words, we are the biggest sellers in this island. Not the East End, the West End. I got the feeling a lot of people are happy with that. 
but I digress. And these are the people I'll list and margins trading with. Take a good look at them. I'll move quickly to the next one. As you can see, Curacao, St. Kitts, Jamaica, Barbados, San Domingue, that's illegal by the way, St. Eustatius, the, the, on the North America, Charleston, New York, Sandy Hook, New Jersey, all of these people, and by the way, two of those are hydrarchies, so hydrarchies can treat, trade with other hydrarchies. It was such a, Bermuda was so beneficial for this, was that they even, that everybody thought this was a good place to trade with. And this was why my good friend George Barclay decided that this was a good place to have a school. Because this was the place where his school could be able to be supported by goods traded from elsewhere. He didn't ever, he never reached here, but his school eventually did. <laughs> I digress. <laughs> Which brings me to black thalassocracy. That's the other ugly word I used here. Um, thalassocracy is quite simple. Word origins, are, how are we doing? Um, thalass means C. It's a, again, complicated Greek word, make people complicated, co make people annoyed. But ocracy, and I'm not just talking about hierarchical organization, but this is different. It's different from the hierarchy. This one was a lateral organization, an organization of peoples in various parts of the, Atlantic, of the Black Atlantic. They constructed everywhere their own trading partners. I'll explain how they did that in a few minutes. It's not hierarchical. It is to use the term by Marcus Redeker, organization from below. This black thalassocracy is going to be extremely important in this discussion, and my good colleague will go further. Well, how did it develop? Simple. By 1720, there was an absolute demand for black sailors. Why? Because they needed to keep white sailors in Bermuda. So in order to keep white sailors, because Bermuda has a notoriously small um, uh, male population, but a notoriously high female population, and so out of fear that, you know, a large number of black men might suddenly, and nobody could do anything about it. What better thing to do is send them, put them on a boat. <laughs> Which, by the way, the black sailors said, great. <laughs> because now we are going to take our mar local market and extend it elsewhere across the Atlantic. We're going to spread it. We're going to construct, as enslaved sailors, we're going to construct a maritime economic power across overseas, which, by the way, us masters may not know about. So, so what you see was a huge rapid expansion in the number of blacks who were part overseas. As part of this, they became, the result was 40% of all black men in Bermuda at the time was mariners. I said it was a Thalassocracy. In other words, they, con they connected with other black men and other black women who were sailors and merchants and others, and they constructed a, a commonwealth across the Atlantic, unbeknown oftentimes to their masters. The masters could care less one way, sometimes they did, but who cares? At the moment, they were constructing this network across the Atlantic, and that was extremely important. Smuggling, therefore, was perfect, because by the way, there was a law that said a slave couldn't basically testify against his master. So what did they say? Great. Why? Because guess what? You said, I provide you with a firewall, you leave me alone. So guess what they did? Captains and supercargoes. In fact, I always quote this man, Greg Cohen, here's how I'm doing. Uh, quite simple. Now, this quote, I think, is extremely important. Their ability as mariners and shipbuilders, their faithfulness as supercargoes, and punctuality with which they manage their businesses um, for their masters and bring home their vessels, no one knows where their, ma their masters don't know where they're going, but anyway, that's not the point. Uh, I've seen several of these black managers. Kremica uses the term patron noir, which can be, which is oftentimes translated as black managers, but could easily be translated as black bosses. In other words, they're manning those ships. They're the firewall. They're the captain. Sorry. They're the, they're the ones manning. So therefore, they provide cover for their masters, and they get to use that cover to do their own trade. And this is the trade they do. Here's a complaint, because the House of Assembly, if you want to find complaints about black folks, just look at the House of Assembly records. Uh, here we go. A common practice among Negroes and other slaves in these islands is send carry abroad and other places abroad, the deep ventures, the brass, pewter, plat, bond grasses, caps, etc. In other words, a lot of stuff. By the way, you can add cows, goats, boats, anything. It's also being added into the, the goods that are being sold overseas. And, and incidentally, keep in mind, once you're in the, I don't know if you've ever sailed in the Atlantic. I know I did coming back here. Um, we decided to take a cruise, but that's not the point. And, uh, <laughs> but, 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 but you realize, this is really big. I mean, the Atlantic Ocean is big. It's like nothing like water. And then you realize that there's some, that you can get lost here. Which means, unless you're Jesus Christ, 
There's no way you're going to know what your slave is doing. And Jesus Christ wouldn't have slaves anyway. Um, so, so therefore, um, I'm going to, but that's, so there we go. Equiano is a good example of this. The voice of that black aristocracy, read his book. It gives you an idea of what the, he basically, he, he's, he's the black man's man. Right? He talks about exactly what they did. Not everything they did, because he you know, get audiences who would probably get him in trouble. But anyway, and this is the point. Simple question. This is the thing I really want to get to is this last point. The thalassocracy was the golden rule out of slavery. There's not a single slave who ever wanted to be slave. So this was the way to get out of it. And that's the point. It was the way to save up your goods unbeknownst to your master and use that to buy your manumission. And by the way, to buy yourself, you had to pay for yourself which is a lot of money. This is one of the things that is really, uh, the thing about slavery that is the most egregious is the fact that these men with a considerable amount of talent and, uh, and ability, and women as well, what would have happened if they were free? Think about that. But anyway, one more point I want to make. He's the uh, last point I want to make on this, and it's quite simple, quick. They went from manumission to abolitionism. By in other words, they went from the idea of, be, of manumitting themselves to, abol to wanting the, the freedom of everybody. That's the evolution that's going to occur in their thinking. And that's what's going to bring about the humanitarian revolution. One last point, and then I'm good. Um, era of good feelings, what was basically to make it to uh, set up uh, my good colleague, is quite simple. Governors who were popular in Bermuda do not mind the government. They don't mind the governor being charged as long as they can tell him what to do. And therefore, and that's how, and things worked out well because governors like, like, like Benjamin Bennett was quite happy to let them go ahead and do their smuggling until Popple came along. And then came the Popples. And Popples are the types of people who really like to basically control. He, William um, Allerard was kind of like your, you know, your, your, your Uncle Joe. I mean, he's very friendly. He wants to be you know, friendly. He just wanted to get along. With, not William. <laughs> he tried to work with him. Dead in office by 7044, natural causes. Um, <laughs> This is like my family picture. This is his, this is Alaric. This is his daughter. The whole thing. I think this picture actually. Um, and then there's William. No children except one. But anyway, um, one child. Um, governor, governor um, of Premier for 4764, as I said, rough periods of time when he was governor. But here's the point I want to make about him. He's the one that sets up the conflict, because he cracks down. He tries to crack down on the smuggling. As I said before, they, they made the point that they were not, what they used to do is quite simple. They would go to the governor and say, if you, if you give us, if you allow us to do X legislation, for example, we will then pay your salary. Because the House of Assembly pays the salary. The governor would oftentimes say, yes, so come on. William Popple said, no, the man never got his salary. <laughs> for the, all the period of time that he was there, he only, and only toward the end, when he came up with legislation that actually would help them, did they pay much some of his salary back. <laughs> but for the most part, he never got all of it. He never got paid back in arrears. He was dead by 764. He left Bermuda because he was sick. I mean, if you see his writing, it's really going off. The, this man was definitely sick. Gets on the boat, he goes back home, and he dies in the harbor. The last thing he wanted to be in that spirit of time is governor. Hmm? Oh, sorry. Oh, hmm? oh sure. Um, he, um, South, he, um, he, was, he remained uh, governor right up until 1764. And then up to that point in time, he basically he decided, I need to go for a sabbatical. I need another sabbatical. I just had one. I need another one. By this point, his writing was, I mean, he was definitely sick. So they put him on a boat. He sails off to, he goes, goes back to England, a rough passage going back, different than the one he came down. And when he got back to England, he basically died on vessel. He never, in, and, he, and this kind of, He's probably, if, you ever, if there ever was an interesting governor in this world, this is one of them. I mean, the man's a playwright, by the way. If you ever read his play, he's, he's got two plays which are really, really interesting. I won't get into them, but they're very interesting. And he's written very, very complicated poetry. Um, but anyway, the point is this. And I have this quote, and I, I like this quote. I, I put this quote as a context for what we're going to do. It's quite simple. A contracted habit of thinking will never improve the good of any place. He that considers the public measure only as it affects himself and, and opposes it from that principle Maybe what the world calls a prudent man, hence the title, but he will never be the lover of his country. That was what Popple said when he had to prorogue the assembly 
basically fire the assembly and then get him. He tried to fire the assembly and then call for new elections. And then when he tried that, the new guys were about as bad as the old guys. So because you know the three people, you know, they easily control the assembly. Bad, I mean, a relative speaking. You know, it's. But there's the point, and this is the question, and that is this: that looking from their own interests, and this is the point I want to make in conclusion, is this: Governor Brewer will come along. That quote sort of sets up how Bermudians are going to engage with their, are they, will they be lovers of their country if they look out for their own interest? That's the question that Popple seems to believe was not possible. But as we talk about prudent rebels, we're gonna make the argument that maybe, just maybe, it may be. I don't know. And I leave it to the, the patriot years and the loyalist years and the economics of treason. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Maxwell. So needless to say that uh, coming into this situation, Brewer was walking into uh, quite a thorny context, if you will. Uh, but Dr. Maxwell talked about the idea of the prudent rebel, um, prudent pragmatism, and that really is the way we should be thinking about the economics of treason and what uh, Bermuda, what role Bermuda plays in the American Revolution, because it's a significant part and it's based on this idea. Poor George Brewer, <laughs> and I say that gently, uh, comes into office in 1764. He sails to Bermuda. He takes the oath of office right after Popple has set sail, and he comes in very optimistic about what he can do in contrast to what the relationship Popple has had with the island and the fact that he thinks he can balance a positive relationship with the island as well as enforce uh, the empire's laws. He will be disappointed. <laughs> in 1764, there's a wider context going on that's going to add strain. And that's that the empire has just come out of a war, the Seven Years' War, primarily fought in North America, but very expensive. And as we know, taxes and debt are a great burden. The empire is looking for ways in which they can fill their coffers, get out of debt. In other places in the British Atlantic, you're talking about taxes that are going to chafe against the population, set tension with the government. In Bermuda, it's a crackdown on smuggling. The Empire the Parliament views this as low-hanging moral fruit. What's the problem with cracking down on illegal business in order to get more money? Easy. But as it's going across the whole, the Empire as a whole, these types of restrictions are causing tensions. For Brewer, it's the discovery that this is just part and parcel of living in Bermuda. He discovers that Everyone accepts it and it just happens, which surprises him at first, that it's just so casually part of the culture. <laughs> ships often just skipped St. George's Harbor altogether. They would take their ships up to their own land, unload their goods, reload what they want, and sail on, never having to go through customs, never paying duties they didn't want, never under restrictions that they didn't care for. And it worked well <laughs> for them. <laughs> But Brewer is committed to reporting any illicit activity that he sees and cracking down on it. He's committed to this, uh, to this British directive. So he attempts to try to force ships, tell them you have to go through St. George's, but they don't. Um, he requests the formation of a second town uh, along Crow's, Crow's Lane and thoughts that if there's a second customs office that's easier to access for people that live on the other end of the island, then they can't complain that it's inconvenient to go through St. George's. He even sends troops to the West End, thinking a military presence there would help encourage people to go where they need to go. They don't quarter the troops, so the tr troops just go back to St. George's. So Brewer keeps meeting with this general easy resistance uh, to his, to his uh, commitment to the law. Um, and that, as Dr. Maxwell covered, is a power dynamic that was set up way before he got there and that he can't push through. And he makes the observation that it has to do with the fact that everyone on the island in some form or another is involved in maritime trade and therefore the interest of maritime trade is dominant. But then we come into 
a much larger crisis in which Bermuda, Bermudians need to adapt, or as Dr. Maxwell mentioned in his radio uh, spot, they have to tact, and they do it very well. In 1775, in reaction to the, the taxation that's happening in the other colonies in North America that's causing the same type of uh, chafing, but with less success than uh, Bermudians are having at ignoring their tax raising, tax, uh, funding the coffers actions, we have representatives from 13 colonies meeting in Philadelphia and forming a Continental Congress to try to figure out how to respond to the British government and ease up on this burden that they placed on them. They organize an embargo against Great Britain, and this embargo includes Bermuda as part of the British Empire. This interrupts a vital trade system for Bermuda, not only their business, but this is where a lot of their food products come from at the time. Therefore, they have to do something to protect not just their financial interests, but the threat of starvation. So they adjust. They pass an act that orders that all um, of a certain type of food good, so we're talking wheat, peas, corn, rice, beans, etc., have to be sold on island. And they cannot depart. And this is in order to keep their tables full. And it works. Ships that are coming uh, to restock on water or have been damaged in sailing are come into Bermuda and they find that they cannot finish their, their itinerary and sell where they're supposed to. They have to offload their product here in Bermuda. This saturates the market. It drives down prices. Uh, captains have trouble getting a fair price for, their, for the goods they're carrying. And sometimes they have trouble getting rid of it altogether. That there's so much food here at some points that they, they just can't sell it. Captains are incensed and are writing to Brewer that this is unfair. Brewer is getting irritated and talking to the assembly, but they don't care. <laughs> there's nothing he can do to force their hand, and so the act stays in place. But there's a general concern that, that this isn't sustainable, right? This doesn't address the full problem that Bermudians are facing with the embargo. So a group primarily from the West End, as Dr. Maxwell discussed, that they have a, quite a powerhouse and they are interested in protecting that. They send a group to Philadelphia and they're searching for a Bermuda exception to this embargo. It's for, at first they make an appeal that's somewhat emotional, uh, fear of starvation, that you know they've long been connected and you would see them suffer. This does not resonate in the Continental Congress. However, Bermuda has more cards in their hand. In particular, the Bermudians have access to a very valuable commodity, salt. Salt is you know, essential for preserving foods, but if you're trying to put an army together, it's very, very crucial. And Bermuda has access to Turks and Caicos salt trade. So you open your door to us and you still have access to salt. This is tempting, but not enough. The Bermudians there also vow to uphold the spirit of the embargo. So any goods that they trade out of North America won't then go on to British ports. They'll go to other ports, uh, French ports, Dutch ports, Spanish ports, but they won't go to the British. And They've had a history of trading with these ports, so this isn't, you know, outside the box thinking, uh, but it does ensure that the spirit of the embargo is in place. And then the last thing the Bermudians uh, lay on the table is gunpowder. Gunpowder is that other very crucial thing you need if you're starting an army. And again, uh, the 13 colonies do not have much of it. They don't have a large gunpowder uh, manufacturing system, and if they need it, they'll need to import it. This puts, in terms of the idea of treason, idea of loyalty to the crown, a little more tension than some of the other behavior. But at the time, this is 1775, this is before the Declaration of Independence, all of these people, including many of the people in the Continental Congress, are still imagining coming back into the empire. They're not imagining a full break. This is just to push the idea that the taxation, the way they've been treated, is not acceptable and that the British will come to their senses and everything will go back to the way it was. So at this point, it's not, it doesn't quite resonate as blatantly treasonous. You know, it's supporting someone, but still within the empire. But they, this is the agreement. This is the Bermuda exception. Uh, access to the salt trade, spirit of the embargo, and access to gunpowder. 
Two ships come out of North America and to the West End. A group of uh, people from the West End take smaller ships over to the East End, break into the magazine, roll roughly 112 barrels of gunpowder down the street. I can't imagine that was very quiet. <laughs> <laughs> roll down the street. Um, load them onto their ships to take them back to the West End. Load them on uh, the two vessels. One goes to Philadelphia, one goes down to South Carolina. And we have the Bermuda exception. Barrer wakes up in the morning and most of his gunpowder is gone. <laughs> He's inf absolutely infuriated. He puts out a large reward for information and remarkably no one on Bermuda has any idea what happened. <laughs> so within the economics of treason, as we get into a full-fledged revolution, it's, it seems just very practical from the Bermudian perspective, right? They have a threat of a food, sh food shortage. Can't let that happen. And there are other parts of the empire that do suffer terribly from food shortages as a result of the embargo. And it provides significant financial gains uh, for Bermuda's merchants, not only reinstating a trade system that they've been using, but now they're playing both sides. Uh, they never officially joined the American Revolution, although there are some overtures to it. They, they say they're not in a place uh, to, to join them, but they're there in spirit. Um, so they're shuffling goods out of uh, these uh, re revolting, uh, <laughs> rebelling ports and getting them to places like Spanish ports, French ports, Dutch ports. But they're also still conducting British business. They're taking things out of British ports, going in out of London, going to other uh, British cities. So they're playing both sides, and it's very lucrative, and it makes a lot of sense. It's not an easy thing. I mean, it, it sounds simple when you say it, but it is dangerous. They are, again, playing both sides. There's the risk of uh, their ships being seized and the, losing their cargo. One of the Tuckers ends up in, imprisoned briefly. Um, but none of this deters uh, the Bermudians because it, it is worth, the risk is worth the reward. There's fear of uh, British warships, if there are too many of them, that makes things difficult. But uh, they never get so many around the island that it does deter trade. Brewer writes for more people. We need more <coughs> troops here, we need more ships here. But they're in the middle of a war, and they can't spare more people to send to Bermuda. And so the Bermudians can continue this uh, very impressive balancing act of shuffling these goods around. And in fact, smuggling is so successful that some begin to fear the end of the war. They, they speak about it in lamenting terms, that it's going to come to an end. And the Bermudians, in this moment, read the room very well. They recognize that the end of the war is coming. Uh, as 1783 is when the war will officially come to an end, but prior to that, they can tell that it's winding down. And they make a pivot towards privateering which is you know, uh, legal piracy. Um, some staunch loyalists on Bermuda have been doing it all along, but more join near the end of the war because that's a more lucrative business as tensions wind down. So lots of big financial pushes. But the gunpowder plot, the Bermuda exception, this playing both sides, these are the economics of treason uh, that Bermudians are working with here. They are not just reacting to these larger political movements around them, they are in many ways shaping them. They're getting salt places that desperately need salt. They're moving goods in between ports uh, to keep people fed. They're conducting business in a way that allows uh, this Atlantic world system to keep functioning during the revolution. And it, in turn, provides a lot of uh, shaping for the world around them, as well as reacting to the world that's there. But these people are, as Dr. Maxwell titled the book, prudent rebels. They are prioritizing themselves, they're prioritizing their colony over these larger ideological forces that would leave them bereft at the end of the day. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Just to change the pace just slightly, I'd just like to uh, take this moment and offer 
a quick observation before I proceed into my paper, if you do not mind. Um, right now, we're gathered here for this very important occasion of recognizing the historical work that's been done on this book, and I think that's a good thing. But something else is happening right in front of us, which I have to draw attention to. And this is recognizing Dr. Clarence Maxwell as an exemplar of professional development. You see? And I don't say that lightly because myself and Alexandra, he took it upon himself to mentor myself and Alexandra from, in her case, as an undergraduate student, right? Uh, myself as a graduate student through graduate school, through early kind of development as historical scholars into my PhD, now into my first job as an assistant professor, and now into authorship. And guess what he did it with, and I appreciate your applause, but also, just check something also. He's a, as a historian of the Atlantic world, I appreciate his methodology, and I just kind of just can't kind of came to me right now impromptu. It was an Atlantic world mentoring. Check that out. One person in the US, one person in Bermuda. Yeah. So here comes the shots fired part, which somebody might not like. But for those corporate entities and government entities and private entities who say they cannot mentor Bermudians, who say they cannot mentor young people and bring them into the field, please see Dr. Maxwell afterwards. <laughs> Black Bermudian fingerprints, smuggling, slavery, and race in the making of America. One of the major interventions of Prudent Rebels is its examination of enslaved blacks in Bermuda and the ways that enslaved sailors responded to the change in political dynamics of the revolutionary period and the ways that their labor and choices shaped certain outcomes in their local context and across the Atlantic. Stated in a different way, we can say that Prudent Rebels offers us a historical way to consider the ways that the use of slave labor and the agency or self-interested choices of enslaved African people change the local landscape and the world. In other words, how does the world created during the age of revolution bear black Bermudian fingerprints? In the, in the 1760s, before the onset of the American Revolutionary War, approximately 40% or more of the island's enslaved black men were recorded as sailors, something that Dr. Maxwell had alluded to earlier. These enslaved mariners were engaged in a wide range of positions. We recognize ships pilots, ships carpenters, navigators, sailmakers, active sailors, and the like. Meanwhile, slaveholders typically directed their labor into three general areas, one being the carrying trade, or essentially transporting goods from colonial locations in the area, what we call the intercolonial trade, for example, if Virginia produced tobacco, how would that tobacco make it to England? Well, nine times out of 10, it might make it on a New England ship or it might travel on a Bermudian ship. They engage in smuggling, as our <clears throat> other speakers have been referencing and hopefully which I'll get into a little longer, into a little later. Obviously, that's commerce intended to evade local and international customs and duties, etc. And given our current interest in that right now. I think somebody needs to do a tag on history, picking up where we end and seeing how Bermudians just seem to like smuggling. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, I'm just wondering. I'm not wondering. And if my bed gets searched next time I come home, I'm going to blame somebody in this room. <laughs> and last but not least, privateering. Privateering, of course, obtaining letters of mark and then going after what we would call enemy ships of the particular historical moment. At the onset of the American Revolution, it created an economic threat and potential decline in the carrying trade since the 13 colonies had placed a trade embargo with other British colonies in the region. Simultaneously, the business of smuggling grew in importance and financial potential as certain members of the white Bermudian merchant class, that West End hierarchy, including folks such as Colonel Henry Tucker, his son Henry Tucker, as well as his nephew St. George Tucker, negotiated an exemption for Bermuda ships as long as they refused to trade American goods with other British colonies. 
and in exchange that they would provide things like gunpowder as well as later on salt and later on weapons, munitions and other products coming from a wide variety of islands. And, this, and as the political standoff between the 13 colonies and Great Britain broke down into an all-out war by 1776, seafaring Bermudians were compelled to grapple with a choice between three major economic options. One, obviously smuggling, two, privateering, and three, military and support service of the Royal Navy. So as we've been noting, most of our Bermudian compatriots had made a decision to shift towards or pivot towards smuggling. But what I want us to appreciate is that changes in the wider Atlantic world's political landscape influence the economic opportunities of Bermuda, something that we still grapple with even in the 21st century as larger global political and economic trends affect our opportunities within the local sphere. <coughs> Therefore, the question that I want to kind of engage is, I want to think about smuggling and how certain white Bermudian slaveholders used their captive black labor forces to pursue the profits and illegal trade for the American cause, and how enslaved sailors made self-interested decisions on, on this part. I kind of like this quote right here because that's been refer referenced by my colleagues. Um, it draws a bit of attention. It's by Governor Brewer. And he's talking about this notion of smuggling at this time and the ways in which the smuggling business itself was largely manned on the kind of nitty gritty on the ground dynamics of it. It's largely manned by enslaved workers. He talks about the person which may be their part, the captain or rather the director or the mate for doing the duty as captain or rather swearing master, the rest all Negroes. In other words, the majority of the crews on these smuggling ships are black, and mostly enslaved blacks. And then in any case, anything of contraband goods that is taken in or discharged, the swearing captain may step aside, and the Negroes and their leaders, as Dr. Maxwell referenced earlier with the other quote from Crevacqua, you know, they had bosses. You have black leadership in the actual carrying out of this trade. One of the ways in which this was actually done was that ships would leave Bermuda under the pretense of going to the Turks and Caicos or under the pretense of going somewhere else. And what, oftentimes they would sail to the Turks and Caicos with maybe a 50% black, 50% white crew, or sometimes a majority black crew. They would offload their white crew members in the Turks, either to wait or to rake salt or to negotiate for barrels of salt. Meanwhile, the ship would sail on to other ports with maybe just a white first mate and all the rest black folks on the ship. This is how that kind of diasporic network between Bermuda and other islands is actually panned out. This is how it actually plays out. This is how you can even see it with Sally Bassett. Sally Bassett, one of the poisons that she uses is from a toad that doesn't even, doesn't even grow, or, or grow or mate or live in Bermuda. Where'd she get that from? Oh, eBay. No, I didn't have eBay in seven. <laughs> Thalassocracy, the connection between black enslaved folks or just black communities, not just in Bermuda, but wider, a kind of diaspora or pan-African network. And largely this kind of smuggling facilitates a lot of this. But long story short, that means that they would sail onto a number of islands. Some of the islands include, of course, as Dr. Maxwell mentioned, St. Eustatius, a Dutch island, Curacao, a Dutch island, French ports, um, such as Guadeloupe and, of course, Saint-Domingue, you know, Haiti as well as a number of other U.S. ports. What does this mean? It simply means that what? You've got a long kind of structure of skills that are absolutely necessary to be successful at this. Rather than just kind of writing this off as illegal trafficking, we need to then kind of interrogate this and what's important. Skills such as obviously sailing and navigation, Obviously doing what? Not using the main ports, but also being a pilot. Because guess what? Nine times out of 10, you're not sailing to the main harbor. You got to sail into some rocky bay and stash the product. Interesting. So you need to know how to navigate and have clear memory of where were the sandbars last time we came to, to Guadalupe. Interesting. You've got to have language skills. You're sailing to Guadalupe, French island. You're sailing to Curacao, Dutch island. Maybe a little bit of papimiento, who, who knows, right? You're sailing to uh, Saint-Domingue, 
got to speak a little Haitian Creole. Ça passe, eh? Na boule, mon chéri. Talk to you afterwards, right? So what does this mean? This means that this wide body of skills is necessary. However, guess what? What makes so that's what makes enslaved people useful. But what makes them profitable is slavery and race. Because slavery and race makes you exploitable. A white sailor actually gets paid a different wage than an enslaved sailor, even when that enslaved sailor is being hired out by his, his or her white master, and that wage is being sent back home to Bermuda. So an enslaved worker is actually getting a smaller share than a free white man. Interesting. Second item that is very useful about slavery is that, guess what? Slaves can't testify against their masters. They can't testify against whites right across. So guess what? Even if you get caught red-handed, all the white guy's got to do is not snitch on himself. <laughs> and look across the room and say, Toby, you better not. <laughs> Are we clear? So slavery acts <clears throat> as a functional tool. Slavery has an economic purpose. Is, is, that, is that clear? And also race. This is even at this same moment in Bermuda where Black, even free blacks aren't allowed to testify against whites in Bermuda. This is at that kind of historical moment. This is at a historical moment where they're seeking to draft laws to evict free blacks from the island. Reed Packwood. He lists all these interesting times from the 1600s and 1700s where they always come up with these interesting laws to kick free blacks out of the island every so often. So even as a free black person, it's limiting. So these barriers of race and these barriers of slavery are actually facilitating this practice. On the other hand, we can see from an enslaved black smuggler's point of view, we can think about smuggling as offering less day-to-day -day restrictions, as Dr. Maxwell has already referenced. It does allow you to travel. It does allow you to network with other communities. It does allow you to actually bring in products. It does allow you to then amass some type of self-enrichment. We don't want to necessarily get all into wealth because it's a little problematic with understanding you as a captive being and actually having actual wealth. But we can talk about comparative profit. You comparing your state as a slave, a slave sailor would often have a better opportunity to amass some type of personal enrichment as compared to someone who's, who remained on the island. Likewise, the uses of these funds. The uses of these funds, it's very interesting when you start reading Pat Wood and other folks who've written extensively on the island slaves, slavery. And you start to see how on earth you start to see pro persons who get manumitted, and then all of a sudden they own land. And you're like, how on earth did they get enough money to own land? And they just got manumitted one or two or three years ago. A lot of this is through these networks and also through family relations. So even though the individual who purchased the land might not have been a sailor, they might have had a brother, a son, a nephew, a cousin, or a close relative who was. Is that clear? So these are these kinds of ways in which this kind of self enriches or works together. And one of the things I want to kind of return back to before I take my seat is this <clears throat> ongoing, oh, actually, before I forget, before I forget, before I forget. The other problem with kind of personal profit is the notion that property can own property. Yeah, let me run that back, right? We understand that enslaved men and women are what? Property, right? Legally speaking. <clears throat> so isn't there a bit of a contradiction between, guess what, people who are considered to be property, then doing what? Owning property. Then selling property and trading property. This is why you see a number of laws coming up, especially around this revolutionary time period, of doing what? Trying to put bans, restricting free blacks or enslaved blacks from selling buying and trading, refusing them to be employed in a wide variety of sales trades. Imagine that, trying to lock down on the initiative of folks. Interesting. Race and slavery even kind of gets in the way of people's business initiative. But I don't want to digress, right? But it's really linked back to this idea of what? The central contradiction of slavery, right? That we can call a human being a piece of property thus, and therefore that human being can't really buy, sell, and trade property interesting and contradictory. But just moving right along, the question that I want to ask is this. How did all of this activity of smuggling, obviously, powered by the labor of enslaved black Bermudian sailors, affect the world outside of Bermuda? The first thing we need to think about is, one, 
Bermuda's enslaved black smugglers ensured the success of the American trade embargo. As my colleague mentioned, Alexandra mentioned, there was a trade embargo with other British ports. Thus and therefore, ports that would have normally traded with the U.S. were now cut off from U.S. trade. Quick fact for you, um, New England, the region of New England in the States, about 80% of all the things they produced, wheat, onions, fish, wood products, would all be shipped, guess where? To the British West Indies, 80%. And that's around about 1769, 1770. Thus and therefore, if you cut off that level of trade, you're really messing with, guess what, the food supply, particularly for the Sugar Islands. Because the Sugar Islands, primarily places like Barbados, Jamaica, and others, guess what? They planted the majority of the land with sugar and didn't do what? Didn't plant much food crops. And I have a great colleague at the um, University of Chicago. He's working on some research which talks about how the, how the revolutionary period was a major shift in them starting to grow more slave gardens in Jamaica as a result of being cut off from U.S. food lines. Interesting. Thus and therefore, what we see is in places like the island of Jamaica, you see approximately 15,000 enslaved blacks die from starvation, malnutrition, and other issues of food insecurity during the revolutionary period. And that's just one island that I've got stats on. A lot of that is obviously, it's a dearth of the types of slave food products which we know are more common. For example, New England produced what? Salted cod, you know, our favorite codfish. Yeah, you know it's not local, right? You guys knew that already, right? <laughs> This is why the majority of most of our Caribbean, British Caribbean brothers and sisters still eat what? Some version of what? Salt fish, cod fish, something, you know, and not just for Bermuda. Why? Because that was shipped on to Bermuda from New England. Usually it was the bad parts of the, of the fish and the kind of better parts would be shipped off to Portugal and other parts of Europe. The second part is this. Bermuda's enslaved black smugglers played a vital role in supplying the products <coughs> which would enable an American victory over the British. Thus, the document of British surrender signed by General Cornwallis and George Washington at Yorktown in Virginia in 187, no, 1781 had black fingerprints on it. The critical question then we got to ask is what kind of new republic had slave labor helped to create? Was this a triumph of American democratic liberty over British colonial tyranny, or was it something else? And I just want to offer a quick little reflection before I take my seat to kind of unpack what is the nature of the new republic that black Bermudian slave labor helped to create alongside white or underneath the auspices of white <clears throat> Bermudian smuggling. This p image that we see up here is, of course, John Murray. He's the Earl of Dunmore, and he's Virginia's final governor, uh, final governor before the coming of the American Revolution. And what we see in the middle is, of course, the date of the Bermuda gunpowder plot and secret trade agreement. What I want to offer is a few ideas that kind of contextualize this gunpowder plot and secret trade agreement. Our good friend, Lord Dunmore, in April 1775, he threatens to free the colonies enslaved blacks. This is largely surrounding his attempt to really confiscate gunpowder around Colonial Williamsburg. He confiscated gunpowder because the Patriots at that time were, had all these rumors of war, and he was afraid that they might do like they did in Bermuda and steal the gunpowder. So he confiscated it. The local Virginians were highly upset for two reasons, not just that he didn't trust them, but also, guess what? They were afraid about slave uprisings. And they said, oh my god, if there's a slave uprising, this crazy guy has gone and taken all the gunpowder. You've left us defenseless. He was upset at them. He said, you guys are crazy, and if you keep kicking up, I'm going to free your slaves. This upset so many people that it was a scandal throughout the colony. And remember now, this is Virginia. This is a colony which has been in close communication with Bermuda ever since its foundings in the 1600s. In fact, St. George Tucker has, is receiving multiple correspondence from Virginia throughout this 1774 and 1775 moment. In fact, you have one colonist in Virginia, a man by the name of Benjamin Waller, he said that Dunmore had lost the confidence of the people, not so much as having from taken the gunpowder, but as for the declaration he made of raising and freeing the slaves. Hmm? <laughs> However, Dunmore goes a little further, and in 1775, in November 1775, 
he issues a proclamation to free all enslaved Negroes and indentured servants that joined the British forces. He did this in response to an October attack at Hampton, Virginia, whereby Virginia pa patriots had in fact raided a British ship that was beached on the shore off of Hampton. And in fact, they burned it right down to its shell. And guess who they used to burn it? They used the help of what? They're enslaved, they're slaves. Dunmore is livid. He's like, you're using your slaves against me and we're the British government? We're the ones who what? Created the policies to allow you to have slaves in the first place. Oh, no, oh, no, cannot be. Thus and therefore, what he wants to do is disrupt the slaveholding regime there in Virginia. And this is particularly important. Why? Because Virginia is a tobacco colony and it's got over 180,000 people enslaved at this moment. Just Virginia alone. This idea of setting the slaves free is in fact picked up in other colonies. It's picked up by British generals in New York. It's picked up by British generals in New Jersey. And even folks such as Thomas Jefferson and George Washington are vocal critics of Dunmore and his decision to free and arm the slaves. Sidebar, he's upset. Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, and others are upset with Dunmore for freeing and arming the slaves. Sidebar, guess who's quasi-free and definitely armed as they go smuggling? Bermudian slaves. Contradiction. Historians such as Sylvia Frey, Benjamin Qualls, Gerald Horn, Woody Holton, and a wide other range also argue that, guess what? His decision, his declaration to free the slaves created so much slaveholder dissatisfaction that it actually increased the support for decolonization and American independence, especially in the southern states. So on the heels of what we see as Dunmore's proclamation, we really see a shift towards not just being upset at England, but totally breaking away from England. And what, as I close, as I hasten to a close, what I want us to do is just think about real quick is the linkage between slavery and the final break with Britain was later confirmed by that famous political document drafted in June and July of 1776 by Thomas Jefferson, a notorious Virginia slaveholder, and Bermudian co-conspirator, as well as four other of his colleagues. And while this document is well known for its very lofty verses on liberty, such as we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and that among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We, we, we heard that before, I'm sure. However, there's a clause within that very famous document, the one that I've got posted up on, on the screen at this time that's a little less known. It's the 27th clause, and they have a number of clauses which are all indictments against the King of England at that time. He has taxed us without our consent. He has quartered soldiers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Get down to the very last one they milk note. He has excited domestic insurrections amongst them. Insurrection is the word they used in the 1770s for what? Slave uprisings. The King is instigating slave uprisings and has endeavored to bring on us the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages, quote unquote. Thus, we must recognize that one of the reasons cited by Americans for establishing their new republic was a fear of black slave uprisings and Native American retribution, primarily focused about the ones who were allies of the British Robert Army. This means that we need to reconsider the notion and think more deeply about the fact that American liberty was wrapped up in slavery. And while it's easy for me to stand here at arm's length and blame the Americans and see how problematic the Americans are, and that's easy, that, you know, that's a Bermudian pastime. <laughs> as well as the Canadians, as well as whoever else we got a problem with, you know, English folks, whoever, whoever. It's a bit more thorny for us to then do what? Grapple with the notion that some Bermudians made choices to uphold and support the establishment of a republic of white liberty and black bondage. For white Bermudian slaveholders engaged in smuggling, they made a conscious decision to prioritize their own financial enrichment alongside transnational relationships of whiteness. 
Meanwhile, black Bermudian mariners negotiated within a less restrictive context of slavery to better themselves, create diasporic networks, as well as maybe enrich their families and friends. Meaning that even though they didn't construct the context of wartime slavery, I mean wartime smuggling, they functioned and tried to thrive within its confines in ways that could best serve their own and, their, and or their family's liberty. So as I hasten to a close, how do we think about this? How did the activity of smuggling, powered by the labor of enslaved black Bermudian sailors, affect the world outside of Bermuda? One, it enabled the success of the American embargo, enriching Bermudian smugglers while temporarily impoverishing loyal British colonies and harming enslaved communities in other places. Two, it enabled the triumph of American patriots in their battle for decolonization and independence. Therefore, we need to think about what a charge of complicity that white Bermudian, white Bermudian British colonials aided and abetted the decolonization of a British colony and laid the foundation of a slaveholders republic. We need to grapple with the seeming contradiction that these activities that enabled the kind of liberty, small l, definitely in quotations, of black Bermudian sailors also included or increased the oppression of black folks in other places. And finally, we need to grapple with what a compelling history that black and white Bermudians must grapple with as we consider the black fingerprints on the foundation of the 18th century Atlantic world. Thank you. Thank you.